the heart of art, scoping the Brussels Valley for the best artists and bringing them to your radio. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Hector Nino. Hello, good evening everyone, and welcome back to the KMU Studios. My name is Hector Nino, and you're listening to The Heart of Art. For today's art announcements, we have uh, the Forsyth Galleries. Uh, they have an exhibition titled, I Made This, An Emphasis of Origin. Uh, and this exhibit is examining the signatures and marks on works um, and analyzes what, where, when, and why uh, these signatures were on these works. Um, and this is on all types of things like paintings, glass, silver, even ceramics. So this is going to be a very educational exhibit. Uh, there was a point in the early Renaissance where art production became a celebration of individual creativity. And that's what this um, exhibit is analyzing. So uh, I encourage you all to go visit it. Um, it is currently on. It started April 19th and will end in July 10th. So you still have some time to go and check out this exhibit. Um, all right. And for today's episode, we will be speaking to a very well-known individual in our community. Um, he is the official artist for the George Bush Presidential Library and Museum and has also been a professor of art and design under the Department of Visualization in the College of Architecture. Uh, many of you know him. His name is Benjamin Knox, and we have a great conversation about art and about his time here at AM and uh, and how he became an entrepreneur at this very time. So uh, I hope you guys enjoy. Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the KMU Studios. My name is Hector Nino, and you're listening to The Heart of Art. Today in the KMU Studios, we have a very special guest. Many know him as the Texas A&M artist, who is also a motivational speaker and owner of the Benjamin Knox Gallery and Art Center. His name is Benjamin Knox. So, hi, Benjamin. How are you today? Howdy. Yes, thank you so much for having me on the show, Hector. Of course. Thank you so much for stopping by. Um, I mean, I've seen your artwork all throughout my college experience here at A&M, so I'm very excited to have this talk with you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and I'm excited, too, to share one thing you expressed is you wanted to know more of the inspiration right. and where that comes from. And so I'm really excited to share where uh, I get a lot of my inspiration and, and so forth. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I like going through the background of uh, my guest and exactly pinpointing where their artistic journey started and when they started uh, thinking about art as a possible career choice. Um, so I saw on your website that you grew up in the plains of Texas, right? Yeah, I started thinking about art. I think that was one of my th first thoughts. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I grew up outside of Lubbock towards okay. Brownfield and we had a horse ranch out there. And so it was actually pretty isolated at the time. And uh, I grew up in that type of environment uh, to where when I was younger, I, I was responsible for about 20 horses. And wow. so, you know, getting up, feeding the horses, maintaining the stalls and all of that was just part of life. I didn't know any different, but uh, I definitely was passionate about art from a very, very early age. And and that was that and sports. I loved playing sports. Right. So... But in that environment, there wasn't a whole lot of opportunity to have any type of um, mentorship or, or anybody to uh, to really help me, except for my art teachers at school, which I was you know so thankful that I had art teachers that could um, you know see I had a, had you know issues as a kid. I actually had um, dyslexia, okay. and back then they really didn't know how to you know, what, what, how to deal with it. And so they just send me to the art teacher <laughs> right. or the music teacher. Cause I also, I love music uh -huh. and, um, you know, it's, it's just, I want to shout out how important it is. The teachers are, you know, and, and for the next generation, how important that is and, and what it meant to me. I mean, you know, my teachers, uh, Miss Day, Miss Carruth, they, uh, Mr. Nitcher, they were so vital to, my development as a human being. I mean, I see your artworks um, show a lot of nature and sports. Those seem to be like the two major themes. Um, 
but I, I see there's not a lot of nature to paint in the plains of Texas. And so where else did you get your inspiration from? Right. Well, at, outside of Lubbock, I mean, we, we didn't have hardly any trees. The sunsets were amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was something I really enjoyed. But I was very fortunate. We'd always go up to New Mexico and, and Colorado, and every chance that I could go, I would head to the mountains. And that became very much ingrained. Um, but in, in, you know, in the plains itself, you have, I mean, you still can find beauty. I mean, I'd, I would just sit in awe of, of the sunsets and, and just the colors and the, the drama which, you know, it's such a giant sky to do that, which still today, and, and I think this, this is a good point to make in terms of inspiration as an artist and kind of my responsibility to portray that. Recently, I was on a, in fact, the last time we were flying, uh, just a few weeks ago, we, we were flying on um, early morning flight, pre-sunrise. And, you know, you everybody sits back in their chair and goes to sleep and and they put the blinds down and so I, I you know I'm, I'm always glued to the window I open up the window and the sun's rising the uh, you could see the coolness and the warmth intermingling you could see the colors intermingling where the clouds were you know this beautiful blue and then this vibrant red and yellow and just amazing colors I mean so powerful and and just to watch and and where I sat I was able to watch the sun literally start to rise come up how it was reflecting in the water that was on the ground plane and through all of that it was just so emotional and so inspiring and for me I just get so excited I'm just sitting there and and I'm looking around and everybody else is just asleep completely mundane doesn't matter and I'm thinking, wow, you know, a hundred years ago, everybody would have been glued to the window, oh, yeah. just clapping and yelling and go, oh my gosh, this is so beautiful. And now we've grown into a society where we're hurried, we're rushed. We don't even think about it, you know, and I'm sitting here watching this absolutely spectacular sunrise okay. and inspired by it. And so I feel like as an artist, a lot of times that's, you know, first off, we're, you know, I'm very sensitive. So I'm very sensitive to my surroundings and, and that interest um, fulfills me. And then it's my responsibility to portray that so that other people could go, wow. I, and, and so I think, how would I paint that? Then people look at it and go, oh, my gosh, that's beautiful. Where'd you get the idea? It's like I was on the same plane as you were and you just weren't looking. <laughs> right. uh -huh. It's important the eye that, that sees the, the thing, right? Yeah, you got you to gotta learn to eye. see. That's one of the things right. I tell my students. The first thing is, is you've got to learn to observe and to see. And there's so much beauty around us. You know, even growing up in the plains, there was beauty. I mean, there's beauty with the horses. Mm -hmm. I just loved uh, loved all the horses and that that I took care of and there was beauty in, in that. So you find, you find beauty. It's there. Right. Um, that reminds me of, I, I pulled this quote from your website actually. And you said, these factors created a longing in my very core to experience and paint the beauty of the world. So I think that's like a perfect example of you experiencing something and then having that inspiration to, to paint it. Would you see that that is your purpose is to paint the beauty of the world? Definitely. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I feel very much um, like it's a responsibility and a purpose. I'm very honored to, to be able to do that and honored that I found that at a very early age. I think that a lot of people, you know, they go through life going, OK, what am I going to do? What's my passion? You know, obviously your passion is radio mm -hmm. and your passion is to to learn and to to uh, transfix that information to people in a large audience over the radio mm -hmm. and so you found that so how next thing is how do you self-actualize mm -hmm. to where you are uh, facilitating the best you can be in what you're doing and I've always been that way in terms of trying to do my best and right. grow and develop and I still am I mean right now I, probably more than ever you mm -hmm. know yeah I mean I'm still working on it but <laughs> yes oh yeah it's oh, a yeah. great start you know um, 
So we are at A and M. So I did want to hear a little bit about your Aggie experience and being here. I saw that you were in the Corps of Cadets. Oh yeah, right? definitely. And what were your interests? What was your major here at A and M? So my degree, uh, my degree was in the College of Architecture. Okay. And I started originally with um, a dual degree. Back then, you could get in construction science and in environmental design and uh, decided to just focus on the design element, the architectural component, to um, move forward. Um, I was completely on my own for school. So in terms of paying for school, I was, I was pretty much on my own once I left home, you know, as, and came here as a freshman. So it would, there was no safety net. There was no, um, nowhere to go, really go back to at the time. And, um, so I was so, um, focused on how I can make enough money to pay for school. I mean, I had some student loans, scholarships were tremendous. Um, I can't, I can't say how important that was. Um, I mean, I can't emphasize how important that was back whenever I was starting off. I mean, every scholarship I got was so instrumental in, and me being able to study and grow, but it, it still wasn't enough to cover all of your expenses when you're paying for everything. So I turned to my art by my sophomore year. Awesome. And so I started doing artwork for different outfits, um, which then transcended to doing t-shirts and posters and art prints. And, and it turned into a full-fledged business right out of my dorm room, nice. you know, in dorm six, Lacey Hall, uh, room 210, that's where I was. And, um, and it was, it was pretty cool to be able to, to grow this. Uh, my outfit made a percentage of the sales. It enabled me to sign at the Memorial Student Center. Um, and by my senior year, it was a, it was actually a very successful growing business. I mean, it was like, I had a lot of uh, people that were, loved my art and were following and, and so, um, wow. so I continued to pursue that and then do the architectural design stuff for fun, which I've, you know, done a lot of that on the side and, uh, but focusing on the, the art itself, mm -hmm. which is interesting because growing up, I was always told from most, most people, most entities, um, that you cannot be successful as an artist you can't make it as an artist. Right. Um, if you want to be successful, you have to use your art in some capacity like architecture or in design, interior design or something like that, that then you could be successful. So here I was my senior year in college having a, a very successful business at paying for school, moving forward, um, able to do, you know, a lot of cool things and, um, and then doing the design stuff for fun, you know, which is kind of opposite. Right, yeah, I feel like most people experience that the other way, but you kind of had like a somewhat of a foreshadowing, I would say, of like your future in the art industry as well. Yeah, I, I was lucky. Um, I, I was very, um, in, uh, very much influenced by uh, comic books when I was a kid. Oh. That was kind of the only way that I could get any sort of art um, I didn't go, you know, didn't have a whole lot of museums, a lot of opportunities there. I, I didn't really have anybody to, to take me or show me. And which if I did, I think it would have would have changed, you know, probably sped up my desire and, and, and more that I learn. I would have learned more at the time. Mm -hmm. But comic books, man, you also learn about marketing. You learn about, you know, how they how they emphasize, hey, coming back for the next comic book, do this. Right. So I actually started in first grade drawing comic books and then I started making my own. And I mean, it's, and I, I did an enormous amount of work as a kid. I mean, in, instead of like um, kids today, which is a concern, they get on their phones and they just watch YouTube and things like that. I would go into my room and just draw and create and how can I draw this better and get better? And I was developing a skill already all through elementary school. By my seventh, by seventh grade, um, I had created a magazine. I called it Fantasy Magazine. And it combined my love for the movies, um, science fiction, uh, 
comic books and all this art. And I wrote stories and different articles. And I was very uh, happy that one of my friends um, had a Xerox printer, which back then was like kind of a rarity. Oddly enough, I didn't think about it till later, but he, he was an Aggie. His, his uh, grandfather had the Xerox printer. And he kind of took me, he, I showed him all my work. He said, yeah, you can print however many you want. So I printed all of these magazines and stapled them together and I sold them at school. Nice. And so seventh grade, I was selling, seventh and eighth grade, I was selling fantasy magazines wow. <laughs> at school with my drawings. And, and right. so I was learning some entrepreneurial um, skills then and seeing what worked and so forth. And uh, that was a great start. You know, high school, I was drawing people's cars. You know, hey, will you draw my car or draw my girlfriend? <laughs> and, you know, and so I would I would make a little extra on the side. So whenever I came to college, it was it was no surprise that I turned to my art whenever I was like struggling financially wow. to say, I know that this is something that I can generate some income and I already have some some entrepreneurial um opportunities in the past that I've learned from that I can apply and so you know I just kind of kept building from there. Wow so you've always been just a creative and an entrepreneur <laughs> your whole life. Um, I did have a question on what your artistic process is like when you are about to you know you think of a piece um, what, what is the first step? Right um, another thing too you had asked about like like doing work for Texas A&M and so forth, which, mm -hmm. which I feel in a lot of ways, I'm an, an ambassador for A&M, Definitely. you know, um, which is, which is a, an honor and a responsibility, but I'll, I'll give you an example to your question on the recent piece that I, a painting I just finished. So, um, I take photographs of the football games. I've been doing that since 1995. And so I have an amazing, I probably have the best archive of photographs because it, it comes from uh, an artistic point of view, but I'm also capturing the moment and the history. And so you name any situation, I've got amazing photographs. And I'm, I'm working on that to compile it as a book um, that I've been, it's a labor of love. I've been co collecting quotes and putting together and and uh, I'm real excited about that and then and then some some way that an archive that people can go through and, and use those to awesome. and search for themselves but I'm <laughs> so going back to the process yes. so let's take this last game um, this last football season you had against Kent State which we had the 20th anniversary of the red white and blue game and you had the stands just all red, white, and blue. Um, the sky at the time was really beautiful as well. There was a glow, it was kind of a blue, yellow glow in the sky. A lot of people don't notice that. They don't notice, oh, here's what the sky's doing. Here's how the sun's reflecting here. It's on the crowd, what it's doing to all the colors. I'm looking at all that, and of course, it's absolutely beautiful. But then you, then you have the national anthem. And the band plays, and every single person in the stand, um, you know, stands up and, and sings the national anthem. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter where you're from, it doesn't matter what your political beliefs are, what your religious beliefs are, what your, um, you know, any nationality or anything, you're all there, you're all standing together, you're all Aggies, you know. And, and, and we're unified. You know, it's a unification. And, you know, in this day and age where you have so much polarization and finger pointing, here is a moment in time where we're all standing together and singing together. And it's just beautiful. Yeah. I mean, you got to admit, the emotional, the, the red, white, and blue, the colors, the beauty. It's like, hey, you know, we're, we're all standing here together. And so then you have Reveille which is walking along with the handlers. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what an awesome opportunity. So I say, hey, can I have you guys set Reveille up right here on the corner of the end zone and let me get some pictures for a concept I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. They're like, sure. So, so we put Reveille and they're just stunning, you know, stunning photographs, stunning image imagery. Wow. And so I take that 
and um, the photographs, the concept, the idea, everything that, that builds into that. I think, wow, how, how do I want to say this? So then I do uh, conceptual sketches. So for this particular one, I, I didn't have to do a whole lot of sketching. I already knew the underlying composition, geometry, how I wanted to do that because I experienced it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I get the canvas, um, lay it out. Um, do oftentimes I'll do like the charcoal drawing on the more elaborate pieces, and then uh, then I'll just start creating, uh, composing with the oil paint, and then I make sure I have all my color harmonies and putting it all together. So the piece itself then can say the message of what I want. Reveille is is the centerpiece of this particular painting. But it really is the, you see the stands with the red, white, and blue, and the band playing, and the yell leaders that are leading, and they're all standing there at attention. And it's really about the emotion in the scene and the fact of, hey, we're unified as Aggies. And, and so that is, you know, a goodwill, positive, inspirational piece. You know, and so all of the, all of the uh, creative process is how can I say that? the best you know how can I say that and, I, and I'm real pleased the, the painting came out great and and I'm real pleased with the overall impact that that it has and will continue to have right that's that's beautiful thank you so much for for that story um I do see that art has opened a lot of opportunities for you uh, not only you know as an artist but now uh I see as a motivational speaker for events and even you have opened your own gallery um yeah, how did you go about opening this gallery? Why why did you think it was important for you to open it? Oh, well, the the first gallery was out of my dorm room and then I had a house uh, right over here on in uh, the south side of College Station. In 1993, I actually opened opened my own gallery and then I wanted to bring back the College Station, the namesake of our city. And so in 2001, um, I did a replica uh, exact replica of the college station, which was destroyed in 1966 because they wanted to make room for Welburn Road. And so the original namesake of the town, uh, the college station, was destroyed. So I thought, I'm going to bring that back. And uh, presented that to uh, uh, my friend, Governor Rick Perry, who said, hey, I'd love to be a part of that. He came and dedicated. the. Awesome. He was the... Uh, main speaker to dedicate it, along with the president of the university, uh, both mayors of the cities, um, all the city council. And my guest of honor at the time was Margaret Rudder, who's oh, a dear wow. friend and, uh, and a lot of history there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, her husband's James Earl Rudder. And so that was back in 2001. And the concept was, you know, obviously to open, not only open the first artist gallery in the in the community but it was to continue to grow and develop um, which become which then became an art center Uh, we've had some amazing exhibits there for example we had um, uh, miss renoir uh, the granddaughter of pierre auguste renoir Uh, she presented photographs who's the french impressionist along with monet manet is interesting when we uh, when we advertise i said yeah we have a renoir exhibit with miss renoir speaking a fantastic sweet lady uh who's who lives in this community actually and we had we had all the photographs and we had the prints and things that they uh, they um, created from the louvre and so we've done a lot of things. We had kids' art camps and art classes. We had live music. Um, we opened the first wine bar in the area as well to try to develop the culture, uh, cultural aspect of it. So my um, original thought with opening the gallery was creating a uh, place to showcase my work, but it just evolved to where it became more of an art center. We rented out for special events. Um, we have exhibits, all of these different things. And it, it kind of became a struggle in recent years when you had the massive economy drop and you've had COVID and you had all these things that have just constantly pounded right. against trying to maintain, you know, an arts center in, in a community. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not 
I don't have any sort of funding or, or assistance in that. It's all, it's, it's something that, that we, you know, pay for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so we're completely reliant on, on our cells and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so that's where now we're having to reevaluate and think how we're going to um, shift our focus so that we can be more effective to, for national um, growth, future growth, and, and the endeavors and things that we want to do. So we're, we're going to, we will be in a, a pretty large state of transition, mm -hmm. you know, coming up again. Well, I wish you all the success in, in your endeavors. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Of course. Um, do you have any upcoming dates that you think our audience might benefit of knowing about? Well, <laughs> we just released a, a lot of new exhibits and, and paintings. So we have a lot of things coming up in the fall. Okay. And, uh, and so we will definitely let you know as those things uh, transcend mm -hmm. as we get closer. And, uh, and also I want to emphasize too, we didn't touch on it. I know we're getting close, if not over time. <laughs> I wanted to emphasize as well a key component in the success of, of my art career and of the business and so forth has been something I integrated into my business philosophy from the very beginning back when I started in 1988 when I was in the Corps. And that came from reading a book by Zig Ziglar, which is the more people that you help and the more that you can help others, the more that it comes back and helps you. And I integrated that and I thought, okay, how can we do that? So we, we do donations and all types of things for um, scholarships. All the scholarships I received, I've started scholarships mm -hmm. in, in, you know, in those in place and, and then some and, and continue to um, help. But we do donations for all types of um, charitable events and, and scholarship fundraising and things that can make a difference and help people by donating the artwork. Not that I donate the money because somebody says, hey, will you donate $200? It's like, well, I can donate $200, but that really won't have much of an impact versus if I donate an art print and you have it at an auction and they get in a bidding war, that may go for $500 or $1,000. It's going to go for more and they get more value out of that. Mm -hmm. But in turn, from Zig Ziglar's principle, um, that's an audience of people that are going to see my work that otherwise wouldn't see it. And so that's a great philosophy that can help grow, be something of goodwill and make a difference in a lot of people's lives. Yes. I mean, us Aggies, we're always trying to do right by other Aggies and other people as well. So thank you for that. And I mean, thank you for, for visiting me and uh, providing the world with these uh, wonderful Aggie pieces and nature pieces. Right. And, and you know, you'd ask a question if I have anything coming up. It's, mm -hmm. I, I have a lot of things coming up in the fall with exhibits and so forth. But, I mean, if people can go to my website at BenjaminKnox.com, mm -hmm. <laughs> easy, and, and we announce everything there. We do, we do plan on coming out with a... Um, a new newsletter or mag e magazine, okay. uh, something to come up so that people can have more connection. All and right. so now that we're coming out of the darkness of being in COVID okay. and all of the stuff that's kind of kept us suppressed us, now we're saying, okay, we want to engage and move forward. So we're excited about the next steps and next phase. And I appreciate you having me on. Hopefully, this is uh, helpful, insightful, and and fun. You know? Of course, yeah, and I encourage people, BenjaminKnox.com, uh, to stay updated on anything that's going on in the galleries. Well, thank you so much once again. You bet. Thank you. Okay.